Hi everyone, I'm Marie and we are coming to you live from Living Felt because it's Happy Wooly Wednesday! Oh, thank you so much for being here with us today, wherever you are, even if it's Thursday down there, <laughs> down under. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Today, we are going to have a little Q&A and some tips and tricks for needle felting pet portraits. So I brought a few things to share with you and some of our BFFs have submitted questions along with their samples. That's what we're going to do today and I so appreciate y'all being here. I want to say hi to a few folks. I know y'all are starting to tune in and um, I see so hi to Gloria up there in Danbury, Texas. Um, one of our first fairies went to school up there for a little while. Hi to Meg in Central Missouri. Hi Grandma Gail, we see you out there. Thank you so much for joining in today. Hi Fairy Holly, if you're watching, she's at home today, y'all. Um, hi to Meredith, Christina in Poland. Oh, so glad to have you all here. Now, so this is an interactive show. Uh, you're welcome to chime in. The chat is going on over here. I see some of our friends already chiming in saying hello. So, oh good, yes, I can see you all chiming in. Yep, just good. So, um, it's an interactive show. Ask questions over here in the chat. We're on like a little extra of a long delay and I'll be flying solo today. I'll do my very best to get your questions answered. But we do have some tips to help you with needle felting your own pet portraits and maybe just a little, um, a couple of exercises to help sharpen your skills. So I hope today is helpful. And with me today, the fairies are here. Now, I know we have some prizes to give away from the last show. So everyone who come, contributes in the chat during the show gets entered to win prizes. And last week we did 2D Q&A needle felting landscapes and we learned a little bit about perspective. So that was really fun. And if you chime in during the live show, you get entered to win. But also if you're watching the replay and you comment down below, you are also entered to win. And I tell you what, uh, Fairy Ann went to grab those winners. So we're gonna just jump right in and get started the first person oh she's bringing it to me now thank you and okay so we want to say congratulations to Lynette Romer uh, R-O-E-M-E-R and congratulations to Pamela they're pushing my my skills today Orishin. 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 Pamela Orishin and Lynette Romer. Thank you so much for participating in the comments down below. We read every single one of them and you are going to win whatever we gave away last week. What was it? It was a gift certificate. So oh, oh, no, those were for the contributors. So that means that what we're, we're going to do is give away today's prizes, uh, which you'll see at the end of the show. So keep watching, y'all. And the first up to share some things that you might consider for needle felting your pet portraits is the lovely fairy, Alyssa. Yay! Yay! Hello, everyone. Since we're um, needle felting pet portraits today, I picked two of the best options for backgrounds for it. Up here we have the 100% wool felt fabric and down here we have the linen fabric. This one is in the color driftwood and this is the color natural. Um, these are the smallest sizes that we carry for these. This is eight by 12 and this is 12 by 14, also known as the picture, picture block size. They do come in larger yardage sizes um, and yeah. Awesome. Up next is Fairy Ann. Yay! <laughs> hey friends, thank you so much for spending this afternoon with us. The fiber that we really love working with for these pet portraits is our MC1 batting, which we have in over 90 colors. And uh, one of my favorite parts about the MC1 batting is the beautiful range of colors that we get. We have lovely solids and heathered colors as well. So this right here, this beautiful thing, is our full range of monochrome colors. So right here we've got black onyx, coal, river rock, slate, charcoal gray, storm gray, winter gray, aspen gray, and natural cotton white. So these, you you're gonna get any shade <laughs> that you need for your project and even blending them together is excellent. So thank you all so much. Next up is Fairy Angela. Yay! Yay! Woo -woo! Hi 
y'all. So our MC1 also comes in assortments that we call studio packs. Um, and so they're, it's six different colors and each one is a half ounce. And let me just put that there, get it situated for you. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so what we have in this one, this is our earth tone pack. Um, it's one of our favorites for doing pet portraits. So this first color um, would be mahogany. This is caramel, milk chocolate, pumpkin spice, uh, oatmeal, and willow. And from round to round, the colors may vary, but they'll still be within that same color range for earth tones. Um, and yeah, so up next is Fairy Kayla. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> hey everybody, Fairy Kayla here. I wanted to show off one of our awesome realistic animal kits since we're doing some realistic pet portraits today. This kit is great kind of toe in the water project. If you've never needle felted before, it looks a little intimidating, but it is not at all. The instructions that come in here will really help guide you through through the whole process of blending color and showing how to use the transfer pen, how to transfer images onto a felt sheet or backing. Um, the kit comes with all of the fiber you'll need plus the background. If you don't have any foam or needles, don't worry. You can upgrade that kit to come with it. If you don't have a transfer pen either, you can upgrade it to come with a transfer pen too. So it's a super fun project, um, and it's really stinking cute. <laughs> and then I had a question while I was up here. Do you guys know why birds fly south for the winter? Why do birds fly south for the winter? Because it's way too far to walk. Oh! <laughs> All right, Marie, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. I just see a big round of hearts for all the fairies. These are the gals who do absolutely everything here that is magical and fun. They make everything we sell. They answer your calls. They answer your emails and uh, help us come up with fun names for stuff <laughs> and kooky jokes too. So hopefully more people are joining us. I know we had some um, more people are coming in. All right. So I know some people are just now joining us. Don't worry. You can go back and watch from the beginning. I think some people were having trouble finding the video. Let me just show you a little sneak peek of just a little glimpse of uh, something we're going to be working with today. This is one of my pet portraits. This is Mr. Diesel. And today we're doing a Q&A for needle felting animals or animal portraits. So I brought just a few of mine along for today. Uh, Mr. Diesel is one of them and he is a dog of one of our customers actually who's also a photographer and she allowed me to do his picture. So really appreciate that and uh, it was a, a fun challenge for me to honor such a beautiful dog and a beautiful photograph as well. Um, so you're welcome to answer, ask your questions and we did have some people who sent us in questions and challenges in the beginning. So I'm going to do my best to read your questions and see what you all have to say uh, while we're working on this project today and how we can be of help. Um, if I can ever get to your chat questions, I will do my best to see those because right now I'm not seeing them. So I'll, I'll chime in over, I'll chime in over here. Um, okay, I know some people are saying they could only get here through the link. Now you're starting to find it. Very good, very good, very good. Okay, so, you know, I brought a few things to share with you today. Mr. Diesel, just a couple of my pet portraits. Not because I think they're stellar examples. What they are are examples of someone who is not artistically trained and went for it. So the first thing I want to say is for everyone who feels like doing a realistic pet portrait is too much of a challenge, I'm going to share with you today a few exercises that I think will help you start to translate more dimension from a 2D environment, specifically for people who are like me and they don't have any artistic training at all. I think it can be a little intimidating and I want to encourage you all to just try and just start. And before I go too much further, I'll just let you know, I don't think we link to it down below, but we link to it if you click on the supplies page. We do have a free video for needle felting a pet portrait or a video series on needle felting a pet portrait where we take you through the whole process of how you can do your own 
and for that one we do this little dog buster right up here to my left so you can watch that including doing one eye it takes 45 minutes and then you can watch it also fast which is like eight minutes to watch it going fast because we just want to encourage you to give it a go and give it a try so uh, I want to start with a few tips and that is one of the first things you want to do if you're doing a passport portrait, one of the best things you can do is start yourself off with a really good photograph. Now this is, uh, I can't share this photograph um, or this one either. This is done by the photographer who's a student, or not a student, a customer of ours. And I edited this photo so that it was set up differently. And I edited it so that, um, his face looked uh, cut off a bit. It was a little different position. Uh, there's a glare there. A little different position than she had originally made it. And um, I wanted it kind of cut off. So the best image you can get for your animal portrait, the better. Especially, you want to get really clear eyes and a really clear image of the face. And I encourage you to get the image to be the size you want for your finished piece. Now your reference image might be a little bit bigger, mine's a little bit bigger, um, but I did make copies to make it smaller and we're gonna walk through some of that together. So that's my first tip is to get the absolute best photograph you can get. One of the first people that submitted uh, the challenge for us had this photo to work from, I think, right here, this photo. It's a very small snapshot, very typical, the kind of thing, you know, we just take a picture with a regular camera and then print out a little four by six or whatever it is. And it's very challenging to get a very realistic, I when you're working so small and this looks large so now she's trying to translate this from from small to large so get the best picture you can blow it up and you might even get reference images of other dogs I looked for several for this white dog and decided not to bring any of them because I'm not sure I wasn't sure whether that was a white shepherd um, or what kind of dog that was and I wanted to match it the best I could but this dog came to us um, from Karen Natali, who says one of her biggest challenges she's had is showing depth in a 2D project. And I would say, me too. And for that, I've come up with an activity. Actually, all of these inspired the activity. Or, I don't know, what's more fun for you? A game? <laughs> a game, an activity, or a challenge? Basically, I've come up with a little exercise um, that I want to encourage everyone to give a try. Um, so she's trying to get depth in a 2D portrait, especially for an animal with a muzzle. Um, another one we had is a cat with difficulty shading and another one getting the white in the eye. So I think what we'll do is let's just start with the outlining the basic pro uh, process for doing the 2D needle felting. And I'll have to read your questions over here um, as we go forward. Um, which reminds me, I, I should grab those monochromes. Someone says, how many, I think they said, how many shades do you use in a pet portrait? And maybe for that, we'll work with, I want to encourage you to watch this video right back here because there's an entire video on just shading for this animal portrait. And what happens is you might start with, say, five or six colors, but then you make your own blends to get the variety in the fur that you want to see. So let's look at a few of the, like, let's look at um, Mr. Diesel here, just as an example, just to bring you in here and look at him for a second. And I'll bring you in close as, whoops, sorry, I'll bring you in close as we, as we do these things together today. So here's Mr. Diesel. And like I said, he's not an example of a really great pet portrait. This was I don't know, maybe my fourth or something like that. I just really wanted to give him a go. And for me, I used several colors in the eye. I used browns and grays up here in the fur as well as black. And so um, one of the things I wanna offer to you is that you gather your color palette um, and consider making up blends to match your critter before you even get started. So if you blow up your picture so that it's really large and you can, 
and get it professionally printed, oh, by the way. Like, print it at Walgreens. It doesn't cost that much to get a large image. But what happens when you do that is you're going to start to see colors in here that your printer won't pick up well. Like um, on one of my dogs, I used indigo in the eye because I could really see a lot of purple and blue. And here you start to see these peachy, browny colors underneath his fur because his skin is kind of, you know, showing through. So get a good quality image, blow it up to the size uh, that you're going to want to make your picture. I thought I was going to make mine this big and use it as a reference. Now some people will use their tablet as a reference or their computer as a reference and that's fine because then on your tablet you can zoom in and see this really close and move it down. For me, I like to hold this in hand, but this is just your reference image. So that's the first thing to do. A good quality picture, the same size you want it to be. But then you want to get um, some versions that you can transfer your image to your canvas. That's like really the next step. But before you get it to your canvas, it can really help to look at your picture in a different light. What we want to do is help ourselves see more into the picture than we might originally think. So I'm going to jump here and then I'm going to jump to some of the, uh, the samples maybe that people sent in to us. And let us know what's helpful and uh, you know what's needed. Now this is the size that I ultimately made Mr. Diesel. You can see he's in the same position. And what I did is I printed it, uh, I, I changed the size in my software and then I printed it in monochrome from the printer. I didn't reverse it yet. I just printed it in monochrome from the printer. What this allows us to do is start to see the highlights, the midtones, the dark areas, and the lines within the fur. So this is just printing it monochrome and not flipping it in reverse yet. And that is really helpful so that you know what lines you're going to trace. Um, let's see, um, I'm reading some of your questions. Someone says, do you need a certain printer? Look, this is just printed on regular paper, regular paper that you get from any office supply. What you wanna do is reverse the image. So let me show you what that looks like. Uh, this is a reverse, and not a great copy, but this is a reverse image. So in Microsoft Word, if you have that, um, Mac, Mac people use whatever image software comes with your computer, uh, or whatever, in Microsoft Word, you can literally just flip the image over. You can say rotate 180 degrees or flip horizontal. That's all I did because I'm gonna use an iron-on transfer pen to get this onto my canvas. So all you have to do is somehow uh, in your photo image editing software or in Microsoft Word is print it in reverse. Now, what I did do to help me a little bit is I made it, you can adjust in Microsoft Word, so I said um, make it a little brighter. I went plus two brighter, and then I decreased the contrast. This is a bad copy. This is the one I ended up tracing right here. To trace this, we use our iron-on transfer pen. You've probably seen me do this. If you've watched any of our video, any of our 2D videos, you've seen me do this. We carry this pen, so again, I've taken my image, I've taken out all of the color, I flipped it in reverse, and it's the exact size of what I want my finished project to be. This is regular paper. And now I've just traced over all the lines that are meaningful to me, that help me see different lines in the fur or areas of shading in the fur. This is really fast to do. And if you feel like you're gonna mess up, well then print multiple copies. It's fun to, to play with these pens. They do come in different colors. I often use black. Um, you're just gonna trace over the whole thing and then we're going to get it onto our canvas. What is your canvas? You can use, I've used felt and I've used linen, so I brought in both here to show you. So this is a driftwood felt. Uh, just, I felt like it was kind of similar to the linen, and here's the linen. Um, so my image still had some color in it, and my iron was actually a little hot for my linen. I should have toned it down a little bit. But this is that, I got both of these prints, 
transfers out of one pass with the pen. So I traced over the image, I ironed it onto the linen, and then I ironed it onto the felt. And for both of these, and this might be a little light for you, I can see what's here. And if you feel like your lines are too light, well then you can get a pencil or a pen and go back over any areas you want and call them out to be a little bit darker. So that's the first thing really is to get a great image that's going to be a reference you can look back to over and over to get your image adjusted a little bit so you can see different values in the colors of your animal um, and you can trace the lines or find the lines that are important to you and you can get your image onto your canvas or your background any way you like. I like to use the iron-on transfer pen. I also learned um, from Danny, like Danny Ives likes to poke through the paper, poke through paper and then do a point and then make the point lines. So that's, a, that's kind of like an old uh, way of doing sewing patterns. We used to have a little tool that would make a hole and then you would put chalk through, but in this case, pen. So there's lots of different options and some people freehand, some people use a grid and then freehand. I cannot freehand my image on. So I want to encourage you to get your canvas nice and flat. Um, because one of the first images we're going to look at today was submitted by one of our friends and she is doing uh, cats, a cat. And she says that she has a difficult time with the shading. But I want to show you uh, the linen, uh, let's see, that she's working on. So first of all, here's a look at the little cat that she's working on, a pretty, pretty uh, gray cat. and. This right here, if I go this way, is, is her current challenge. So she has the cat on linen, um, but the linen is very wrinkled. And she says that she's having a difficult time getting the detail, uh, the shading and the light areas uh, in the cat. So one of the first things I wanna encourage is that your canvas is ready for the job that canvas, that material. I know some people always ask, can I use craft store felt? Can I use this? Can I use that? When you're doing a pet portrait, you're going to be applying the fiber in a very dense fashion. There's gonna be a lot of fiber on there that you're compacting in. You want that surface material, whatever it is, not to shift a lot while you're pushing the wool into it. So. An example is a fabric that buckles a great deal. It's gonna shift and what will happen when you're dealing with these very fine areas um, of lines, detail areas, is if, if these lines start to shift, what happens is the eye gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So craft store felt tends sometimes not to hold up to that dense compaction of fiber. And this is our wool felt. It comes in, I don't know, many, many colors. It's only a millimeter thick, but it's a solid millimeter. And you can put a lot of fiber on here and it's going to move very little. And you're going to have all, you know, all the surface area that you need to put your fiber in. So your material really matters. If you try and work on something like a pre-felt, I'll tell you uh, from experience, something that's not fully felted and has a lot of loft to it, the more you start, like if you start on the eye where there's a lot of detail, then that material starts to compact and all those lines shift in. That happened for me on this guy right behind me. And as soon as I started on the eyes, and why don't I pull him in so some of y'all can see him. I, I started on the eyes and then I, you'll see that they're very dense or there's a lot happening in here. Um, but as soon as I started putting all that material in, this is our MC1 batting and I just got it to like a, a pre-felt stage, not fully felted. And what happened is as I started compacting all of that wool in there, it really started to shift and all my lines started to move in. So after that, I had to find my way. So that's my guidance for you when you're looking at your base material, make sure that it's going to be able to support the density that you're putting into it, you know, of fiber. And I'll pause here for a second 
and see. Uh, okay, so Teresa Burnham is the one who shared the cat. She said the linen was wrinkled because I just washed off the soluble stuff that she'd used to transfer the image. I see, so she had transferred the image and then I still would consider ironing it out if possible, maybe with a, a sheet protector, uh, like, I'm sorry, like a top sheet so that you get it all smooth and ready because if there's any wrinkles under there, then they're going to contribute to the overall piece. Um, and I just want to say a big thanks to everyone who did submit questions for today. We have prizes for you, of course. We appreciate you putting yourself out here. And I, your cat really inspired me to try something different. And that's the activity, actually, that we're going to share today. Okay, so you want to transfer your image to your canvas. That's the next step. And then you want to gather your color palette, whatever that is. So I'd love to hear from you all, maybe, if we look at this little guy, Buster. I'd love for you all to chime in and say what colors do you see here oh sorry about the glare what colors do you see here when you look at his fur give that a little thought what colors do you see here when you look at his fur what is coming out to you um, Lori in Austin says the most frustrating thing is knowing it's going to take me years to get that good if ever. Lori, I don't think so. I betcha, I betcha not. I really, really, really have some strong encouragement for you all here to give it a try. I really do. Um, let's see. I'm looking for uh, I'm looking for some ideas. So in here you can see browns. Like if you're looking at our fiber, you can see like a really dark chocolate. You might see some cinnamon brown where it's a little orangey. You might see some clay. You might see some gold. Uh, you might see some espresso brown. You might see some I don't know tan here or caramel. Definitely this is a very stark white but in here we have a little bit of color the nose is very difficult like the the he this picture was blown up so the nose is difficult because this all just goes into the abyss of black on the photo even um, but here we have some pinkiness on his face here in the eye um, is where I found some purple to put in here and not just black so one of the things I want to encourage you to do is really look at a range of values. I'm gonna see if I can grab that, uh, that monochrome palette that the gals uh, brought in so we can use it real quick. So I hate to, I hate to leave you. <laughs> I have to jump out because there's no one in here to help me today. But uh, let me put these two little guys down and I'll, I'll show you my, uh, my little all black guy as well. Um, Daisy was very, very challenging for me, the little black dog. Um, I think that all white and all black dogs can really be a challenge. And honestly, I wouldn't start there. I wouldn't start there. Start with the brown. It doesn't matter if you start long hair or short hair, but I think that they're really a challenge. And again, I don't put these forward as like great examples. I put them forward as an example of someone who is just really trying uh, to stretch beyond her current level because realism is not something I had ever I had ever really endeavored to do before. I wanted to try it uh, with these pet portraits. So start with a good photo, start with a good um, image onto your base canvas, start with a good canvas. Someone else said they're working with cotton. Tell us what kind of cotton you're liking because I, I bet it's not quilter's cotton. Like I used to use a very inexpensive cotton cloth as well and I liked it okay. I found that I liked the, the more dense weave linen a little bit more. Okay, so someone says picking colors seems like it might be the biggest challenge. We have a video for uh, blending colors for animal portraits that we did together where you all submitted animals and then we blended colors, including long fur and short fur. I think we did grays, I think we did a try, I think we did um, like caramel colors. So I really encourage y'all to um, check that out and maybe give it a go. So when we're looking at uh, colors, and I probably have to zoom out here again, when we're looking at colors, there really is, there really can be a lot to choose from. Um, and if you start to build your color palette, 
you can see that there's a lot of places you can go when we're building an animal portrait. So when you're looking at something like this beautiful little cat uh, up close and personal, there's a whole bunch of light in this cat. In fact, the lightest areas are right here on the top of the cat, but I would not make those white. I would probably say, well, those are this aspen gray. So you might take your animal picture. I'm gonna be using this again. You might take your animal picture and again, blow it up and start to gather yourself some little puffs that you see in the image. Here's aspen. Maybe you're gonna have some white, but maybe you're just gonna lighten the aspen gray. I challenge you to avoid pure black and pure white, um, except for the smallest reaches. And here's this, so he almost looks as I look at this like a little more of a brown gray. I'd probably bring a little willow into this guy now that I look at him. In fact, I have some willow in this pack. And let's see what we think. I, even though he's gray, and maybe it's because I can't see him in person, um, this is willow and it might look like gray, but a little bit of willow can really help sometimes willow or brown can can assist with a gray so i might bring in a little willow into that guy uh, so or a little bit of brown you can start to build a little color palette maybe some parts of him are charcoal like maybe you use charcoal in these little areas here instead of a solid gray because it has a little bit of light coloring in it too but it's darker than willow and i encourage you to start with what you think is your color palette here this might be for his nose or these you might only blend it start gathering a little color palette and then from these make blends and if you will if you will watch the video where i make Buster, the, where we do the blending, uh, I show you exactly how we take, I don't remember how many colors, I wanna say it's like five or six. It, it's probably me, it's probably more, because I want every piece of candy in the store. But um, then we take those colors and we make blends to make the transitioning of the fur easier. If we, sometimes I think that those of us who have a little less artistic training, that we don't really know how to approach a picture like this and I'm that person. So everything I say, you have to know I'm that person. So when we look at something like this, I think that sometimes what happens is we put down an amount of color and then we try and find our way through the detail here. We try and call out the detail from putting down a solid color and putting down. Now, I don't know if that was her technique. I'm just saying I do see often that people will put down color and then try and find the detail underneath. So what I want to encourage you to do is gather that color palette, consider making up your blends before you even get started and then work on your picture section by section at a time. Now, that sounds like direction, but to me it's still really vague. How do we work on that picture section by section at a time? Last week we brought out the um, transparency sheets and we brought out the uh, iron on, not iron on, the dry erase pens. That's what we did last week. So just to, even as one way of an approach to start seeing the lines in your picture, even before you trace it, maybe even before you trace over it and call out all those lines, is pull out the pen, pull out the overhead transfer pen. Now I've never drawn a cat, so I want you to know that your cat, my friend, Teresa Burnham. This is the first cat even close to realistic that I have ever drawn. <laughs> Thanks to you, I gave that a go. And I just did it with the iron-on, uh, I keep saying iron-on transfer pen. I did it with the dry erase pen over your drawing. That's a great place to start if you can get one of these, is just use a, a overhead pen or even a Sharpie marker and start to see where those lines are. You're gonna start tuning yourself into this picture. But stay with me because I have uh, one more suggestion 
to get more detail out of this picture. And I want to jump over to this dog before we, before we do that. And this is a great submission. Again, again, this came from Karen Natali, who says she has troubles when there's a long muzzle. How do you start to achieve you know, getting this definition that you see in here? How do you go from this flat piece of paper to start to be able to see all the shapes that are in this muzzle? And I think that what we need to do is start to practice. Most of us who are looking what other people are doing, oh, I should say this, I think a lot of people come to felting who maybe didn't pursue an avenue of study in other artistic mediums. I know that's true for me and a lot of people I meet sort of found their creative expression with felting, didn't have artistic training background. Now, I do have great friends who were trained artists or experienced artists who painted or drew before they came to felting and their felt work is stellar, of course, especially like 2D is stellar, but not all of us had that training. So because of your cat, Teresa, and trying to test my um, theory, I drew my first cat. Now, if I were to draw a cat all by myself uh, with uh, just y'all telling me to draw a cat, it's going to be something like this. If you said, Marie, would you draw me a cat? This is about as far as I would get you know, with drawing a cat. Honestly, I'm whimsical. I have no idea how to draw a cat. I don't own cats. I have no idea how to draw a cat. And that's probably about as much as you're going to get out of me is something kind of like this with a tail. I can't draw a cat. But if you have a picture, you can start to give it a go. So I'm gonna share with you my first, here's the first cat drawing that I did from Teresa's uh, picture. Here's the first one, a rough pencil over her kitty cat. Let me find, oh, he's underneath my paper. I did a rough pencil over her kitty cat. This is, you know, start with your overhead pen and then do a rough pencil over your kitty cat using vellum or tracing paper. And then this is, me starting, this is my second cat, if you will, working on from her photograph. So I didn't spend much time doing this, to be honest with you. I just sat with the picture of this cat underneath my tracing paper. I drew those initial lines, this one, and then I set it aside and then I did it again. And then I sat with my pencils and I taped it so it doesn't move and listen to a television show <laughs> playing in the background and just now I, I'm going to switch pencils here I'm going to give you all a little a little insight to some pencils if you want to grab some pencils uh, pencil people who draw on pencil have different pencils some people will use all 2b and some people will really switch it up I'm going to use a 3b um, and maybe a 5b just to show you that there are different pencils out there uh, where's my 5b that you can play with. Oh, I, I guess I didn't bring it. I'll see if I have it. There are different pencils that do different things. And so sometimes you'll wonder why your pencil isn't giving you some interesting results. Um, you can get these Statler pencils. Uh, these are Mars Lumograph. These are the Statler drawing pencils. I think you can get uh, Statler pencils for like a set for like 11 bucks on Amazon. I don't have a link for it or anything. But all I did was start drawing this. Now this is the activity I want to encourage you to do, is take your image, especially if you feel like you're not good at realism, and with a very light, light pencil, start allowing yourself to see the different areas of shading on your photograph. You, you, you're not losing, risking anything by doing this with a pencil. And what's gonna happen, besides that you end up with a drawing on uh, transfer paper that you don't really know what to do with, but what's gonna happen is you start to train your eye to see things that you didn't see. Most of us who don't draw or don't have experience drawing, we're gonna put down hard lines like this. We're, so we're just gonna put down lines, let me use the back of this guy, we're just gonna put down lines. We're gonna see lines like top of head, top of ear, bottom of neck. 
And as you move over to here to this guy and you're working with your picture underneath, you can take those lines and start to soften them by pulling down from the line into whatever area of shadow you see beneath. And I'm gonna pause here in sec just a second because I'm sure some of you have some really brilliant suggestions um, that I don't know about because again, I'm, I'm not a trained artist. For me, this is all exploration and sometimes just a personal challenge to kind of see what can I do, what can I achieve. Now the fun thing with pencil that we can't do with fiber is once you get these lines on, then you can just drag it out and shade it a little bit and start to get that color in there. I still encourage you to do it because what will happen is you're going to start to make a picture. You're going to build confidence in yourself and your ability to see details that you didn't see honestly 10 minutes ago. You didn't see until you put this paper over there. And where you want highlights, then you can just bring in your little, bring in an eraser of some kind and just pull lead out so that maybe you get a highlight where you didn't have one a minute ago. So this is my uh, third, th my second cat picture, one and two, <laughs> thanks to Teresa. And I wanna suggest that for those of you who feel challenged, pick up a pencil, pick up a piece of transfer paper. You've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. And the most of the thing we're going to gain is starting to train our eye to see what we didn't see a minute ago. If you get some pencils that are beyond your basic pencil, what happens is there are hard leads and soft leads. So the, and there are some pencils that will like make things even darker. So you can play with those and you see like sometimes you put down a pencil and it just mushes out and sometimes the line is perfect and sometimes it feels too thin and too hard and that's because there's different types of leads but you can use them to train yourself to draw a little bit and I encourage you to get some different types of leads just so that you have a little bit of more mobility in your, your ability to put down color on a piece of paper and get lead on a piece of paper as well. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over here and see what some of you are asking. Um, Y'all are talking about colors. Okay, you're liking the way to train your eye. Uh, Liz Mosher says, I don't really have a lot of time for this. This would be a great vacation project. Yeah, you know, this cat drawing, I, I mean, I couldn't have spent a half an hour on this one side of the cat, but doing a needle felted pet portrait does take a lot of time. It really, really does. Um, this, y'all would love a list of materials. Please visit the, uh, the, pet portrait video or click on the supplies for today's show. If you click on the supplies for today's show, we give you some kits and supplies down below and you can access this tutorial series, which includes a list of materials for you. I think there's a, a support PDF that gives you guidance uh, for that. So please click on the supplies for today's show. Um, <laughs> So tracing, yes, a light box would be great, very helpful, Kevin mentioned that. Um, someone says, no way, that's your second. It's not my second cat drawing, it's my second cat tracing. So keep in mind, I'm just tracing, and I'm tracing for the effort of learning. And I, you know, I want to tell you also, I first was, came to felting, I used to draw, but I drew very playful, very whimsical, fantasy type creatures and I decided or beings and I wanted to make them in 3D. A few years ago I was needle felting a robin and I wanted to wet felt a robin and I decided I needed to learn more about the robin and do a robin study. And so I made, this is colored pencil behind me, it's not felted. Um, and I did that in color pencil to study and learn the robin. And I shared it on my Facebook and got lots of advice about how to correct it, but I really didn't care. I did that for me to push myself to try and do something, um, learn while doing. And that's what I wanna encourage with you all also, is to learn while doing. You can't lose anything by using some tracing paper and a little bit of vellum. So I've shared with you my activity. Now we do have another question here and that was um, Jennifer Davis says, how do I get the white in the eye? How do I get that shine? I did bring my, uh, let's see who will do. I did bring uh, a little bit to show y'all how to do that. Who will we do? 
I don't know if we can add, let's add a little bit of glint to this little baby right here. So she said that when she puts wool into the eye, it just disappears. So this, by the way, is all done with our MC1 batting, the same fiber the gals shared with you earlier. The back is just a gray sheet of wool felt, and that's what the back looks like. So this is our 100% wool, one millimeter wool felt. Again, click on today's supplies and you'll get to that. And this is MC1 batting. So. To get a little glint in the eye, I would say, first of all, don't go to pure white. Don't go to like the CX2 white. When you're adding little glints, consider doing something like um, Aspen first to see if that will work. And use your fine needle for this. This is a project for the 42 triangle. I'm gonna add a little glint like right over here. Follow what's in your photo. Uh, the glints should always be, um, you know, you want them to match what you have going on. But so I'm gonna drop a little glint right over here just so you can see that it's possible to put a little, actually let's put them right down here. It's possible to take a little blob like that, a little tiny piece, and with a fine needle, I'm just gonna poke it in. I can always take it out if I don't like it. I'm gonna go just on this side and twirl. We don't need to poke it all the way through to the other side. We can just add a little drop of color there and so you might look at that and go, well, that's not quite that's not quite light enough. I put the aspen down. Well, then let's try cotton. Cotton is our natural white. Um, cotton is our natural white as opposed to something that's super highly processed. Sometimes you'll be surprised that it's white enough for what you want to achieve. So when we're doing a little touch like this, you want to go gentle. This is going to be very bright. You can see there I used gray and this is white. So you can see, now I, it's too bright, so I'm not gonna leave it in there, but I want to show you that you can tack very lightly, and remember you're just needle felting on the surface. If you want to get a nice impact, like this might look nice right inside that guy. So I'm gonna pull him out. I didn't drive him through to the next continent. So I'll pull him out, and you can always needle felt that flat. Let's drop this right inside that glint, and that's gonna make that look a little less white. So let's put that right inside there, and then the rest of the highlight will kind of uh, come off of that. I'm gonna twirl it and poke it in there, and I think you'll see that this just became a little bit brighter and coax in those little ends unless you want it to spray out. But there, now that just got a little point of brighter and it doesn't have to go all the way through. So the wool there is very dense. I used a 42 triangle and that allows me to put that just right on top. And when you're doing them, you know, notice the underneath, this inner parts of the eye. You really want to dissect an eye and I think the eyes are part of what gives it such realism. You want to really dissect the eye and not fill it, you know, not fill this black outline so strong. Go with a dark gray here, try a slate or try a coal and make sure that you outline the eye and you get those little white parts of the eye. Whatever you see on your critters, leave yourself room for all of that you know, area and detail that really is in our natural eye and our and our critters natural eyes as well. So let me see uh, what questions you all have. And thank you all so much for your patience and being here with me today. Um, okay, let's see what you have to say. Uh, Brenda says, I have a hard time knowing if I should match the location of the white glint in both eyes or if they are independent. Um, and I will, let me pull somebody over here. Where's my photographs? I, I bury everything. Here's a photograph. Uh, here's a good example in this guy right here. Okay, so this guy is, this guy, sorry, here we go tilt him up so he's not there. So his is actually, um, and I don't know if this light's coming from two places, but this one is on the lower bottom and then way up here. And I think, you know, we've all been taught, well, it goes on the same side of the eye on each side of the, you know, whether it's on the iris or the pupil. But when I look at these photographs, I'm just doing what I actually see. So here with Buster, 
his um, were on the, maybe it's the curvature of a dog's eyes are different than the curvature of our eyes. I don't know. Maybe it's true. Maybe they're, they're just more exposed. But you can see this is on the inner and this is more on the inner as well. So there's a lot happening in those eyes and they're not just like kerplunk kerplunk on the same side of the eye, which is how I was initially trained to do people. Um, and in here, let's see, let me grab one. In this one, I want to encourage you. So that this is him. And you know, I know it's not exactly realistic. I know. I'm not kidding myself at all that this is exactly realistic. This for me was a fun challenge project and a fun way to share, hopefully a non-threatening way to, you know, begin to do your own pet portraits. We can't share this image, so you have to get your own um, or get another boxer. But um, it's fun to get in here, and this is where we used blue or indigo in the eye. Very often you're going to see some other colors in there, and I just did my best to make it sort of sparkle, even if it's not an exact match, make it kind of sparkle like this guy. And I do think that we share him during the process. We share the eyes while we make them. This one over here is super hyper-realistic, obviously, and mine's not, but whatever. I just want you to have fun. So these are my few tips are to, if you're having difficulty with a dimension, do the tracing exercise so that you start to see more in the picture and what's happened because you're using pencil because you can shade with your finger because you can take away uh, with an eraser then you start you're going to train yourself to get a little more intimate with that particular picture and your efforts are going to be a little bit different when you go to do it in wool. Um, the only difference with these, these is I filled in the background with wool the entire way. Uh, so this was just done on a white felt sheet on the background. This one was done on a gray felt sheet. I've also done them on linen. Um, so, and it's like some other people said, they've done them on cotton. So what um, can we answer for you. Talk about noses. I really struggle with making realistic noses. You know what? I do too. And I think what happens is we tend to put down like a big blob of black on the nose. And so again, mine are, mine are not those of a professional uh, artist or even someone who's mastered this. <laughs> um, I'll get my, let me, let me grab a couple things. So let me pull this guy in here again, because I think his nose is a little better. Um, but really I'm going to say is don't put down a big blob of black for the nose. Okay, if just inside the nostrils is black and this line is black, but all out here, you remember that you have a front and a top of the nose. So the front is often worn down or a little bit lighter. Um, you want to somehow show how do you show um, that there is a roundness to it. Start to study your picture and see what you see in that picture that starts to you know give it shape tracing out those shapes so that it's not blomp on the nose just like that start to see how you get uh look at the photo for where the light is falling onto that nose where's my photo see how the light is falling on the nose when you have a good nose now this one i think you know, if I were to do it again, I would probably do it differently. But that is the only black part of that nose right there. All the rest is very frosty looking, a very gray and frosty looking. And, and this photo is actually not edited. All I did was take out the background and all the rest of his body. So study your photo and see where you see how, see how there's light here along the rim see how there's a separation here if you trace it if you tried trace and drawing at first you're going to start to see those things that you might miss if you just sometimes we just put down a big blob of black wool and then we try and get the detail but right here and right in the nostrils is the only places where that nostril is really black yeah getting all my pictures back up so what else would you like to know or what else do you want to ask before we part off for today? Um, okay, what's the question, Emily? 
uh, asked a question. I can't, I'm having a difficult time reading and, and talking. Uh, usually someone's here to help me with a question. So what was the question that Emily asked? Um, Emily says, do you block each color or do you lay down a base layer first? Emily, for me, um, I don't lay down a base layer. Uh, my approach has been to do an eye, to do an eye, to start to build out from that eye, and then to start fill out the fur. So do the eyes at the same time. You might start with the nose, but I would say do each section. It's okay if you go back and you add more areas of darkness or more areas of highlight, but I would encourage start with your color palette, make up the blends you think you see, Never let yourself run out of a blend so that if you get down to the narrows of that blend, make it again before you run out. And then tackle each section. If you start with an eye, then you're, for me, it brings the picture to life and starts to really give it personality. Some people like to start with the nose, maybe because it's the furthest part out. Um, and you might do that. If you have trouble building the face without building dimension to it, um, then you might start with the nose. But I would say do an eye and work on the other eye at the same time. And I do. I build the eyes at the same time. And that's only because I'm not experienced enough to do an eye 100% and then go do the other eye the same way. I need to build them at the same time. And that's just because I'm, I'm a novice when it comes to doing a realistic animal portrait. So I don't put down a big blob of black and then try and fill out the detail. I think you find your way across this picture when you're working on it, I start with that eye, the eye, work to the outer, work to the outer, work to this part of the eye, work to this part of the eye. I might do the, you know, the black lines and then fill in between. And again, I know mine is not perfect um, at all. And I find that, you know, the black is really a challenge. Um, you want to try and follow the direction of the fur if you have a longer fur animal as well. Um, so like this guy, it's the same fiber, and it's just a matter of drafting it into like these little brush strokes. But I'd start with the eye, and then work my way around the eye, and then I might do this panel and this panel. You know, I do this whole part at once, but I don't put down a blob of color. Um, I fill in, fill in, fill in. That's just, that's just my approach. Might be what you like to try too. Okay. Uh, Brenda, thank you for the props on my cat drawing. I almost want to go back and finish drawing him as if I drew it. I just traced him. Okay, good. I'm glad that you guys uh, have found this helpful. How do you do whiskers? You're going to do whiskers the same way you do uh, the other parts. So in this case, the face is all built out. And maybe we could do like a red panda is so non-threatening, right? I mean, maybe we could do something like that. But so after you have the face built, and this is just MC1 cotton, y'all. It's uh, just our, our regular cotton white. Then I would anchor it from here and then draft it out. Draft, you just draft it out as you're doing it here. Usually don't do it with the, um, I'll, try, <laughs> I'll try and press down. Usually don't do it in the, in the hoop, but let's find my needle here. So you can um, anchor it right here at the nose and you can pull it out to a thin piece as you want. But what I like about MC1 is that you can draft it as you work. So you can anchor it right there and you can draft it while you needle felt. This is the same way you would do like the long fur bits. I don't know who asked that question, but thank you for this question. And um, just take it as far as you want. Be sure you give it a nice little bend. You see, when you're using a fine needle like the 42 triangle, it's not gonna go through to the next continent. So you can just taper that off there, bring them to a point just like that. Yep, that's how you do a whisker. So with the MC1, it's very easy. You don't need a long fiber. You can just trail it out. So are there any more questions before we go today? It looks like we're just about out of time. What is MC1? I'll answer that. Jenny says she's in Goleta. That's where Living Felt started, technically. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, very good. Don't say tacos. I missed something. So uh, somebody asks, what is MC1? MC1 is Living Felt Signature Fiber. It's our Merino Cross MC1 uh, batting. 
It comes in over 90 colors. It's what we're always sharing and we're using so much. And it's what I used on every one of my pet portraits. It's the same fiber that the gals show at the, at the beginning of the show. They only showed a small range of our earth tones and our uh, they showed our monochrome palette. But it's a short fiber domestic breed sheep. Uh, so it's sheep raised right here in the USA. We wash it in a very eco-friendly process. It is, meaning the soap is very eco-friendly. Um, there's no harsh chemicals applied to it at all. So you will get a little bit of vegetable matter because we don't go through that chemical burnout process. Um, it is air dried. It's dyed right here in the States and carded here and all of the fairies uh, pack it up and make it right here at Living Felt Woolly Wonderland headquarters. <laughs> so that's it. I know um, Anne's probably been submitting some names. Here's Anne. Okay, so for everyone who's participated in today's show, and thank you so much for, for hanging out with me and doing this. I can't wait to see your pet portraits. Remember to click on the supplies link for today's show. That's going to show you some of the supplies we've already shared with you. It's also going to take you to um, this where you can watch this series if you want. I think there's a PDF affiliated with that, right? And that's going to help you just learn the process no matter what critter you decide to do, but you do get to see that dog made in its entirety. I don't know if I showed the filling in the background, but whatever, that's easy. So give that a go and thanks for playing with us. Now, um, if you make something from what we share with you, make sure to share it on Instagram. Hang out with us on Facebook. That's where we are all week long. Everything we shared is on our site, livingfelt.com, and we have more advanced uh, classes on feltingtutorials.com. But right now today, Anne brought in prizes to give away. What do we got, Anne? <laughs> are we giving away these? We are. Oh, yes. okay, okay. So winners today get to pick a MC1 Studio Pack. We recommend either the monochromes or Mr. Earth Tones. For animals, but we also have blues and summers. We have a fall pack. We oh, have yeah. a we primary. Have a beach pack. Yeah, we have one that could be kind of like Christmas. We have green. So we even have what? We have something else. Anyway, lots of stuff to choose from on the MC1 pack. So you're going to pick a name? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, I'm totally Anne's missed gonna that. Anne's going to draw a name. <laughs> so we're going to give two names right now, and we're going to pull two names next week from everyone who leaves mm -hmm. comments down below. So today's prizes are going to, uh, first of all, we're going, we have prizes for the three people. Thank you so much for submitting your work. Jennifer Davis, who submitted the cat portrait, Teresa Burnham, and Karen Natali. Thank you so much. Oh, I didn't do, I didn't share Karen David's picture, but we did answer your question. So thank you so much. We have gift certificates for all three of you and for everyone in the chat today. Your names went in Anne's Magic Hat. And who do you got? Mm -hmm. I have Juliet Bartolo. Oh, very nice. And I have <laughs> Kathy Van Camp. So thank you all so much for playing with us. If you enjoyed today, well, we hope you'll make a pet portrait. First of all, make sure you tag us and leave a comment down below. Let us know either your question, maybe what animal you would like to learn to do in 2D. That would be a fun one. Um, and, or maybe your favorite takeaway. But until then, just be extra, extra, super good to yourself. Take care of yourself. And next week we're gonna come back with, I think we're gonna do a 2D, 2D needle felting project together. So I'm Ooh. looking forward to that. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.